Welcome to this Easy Composites video tutorial on pattern making. In this tutorial, we're going to be demonstrating an effective method to take an original product idea for a fiberglass or carbon fiber part and turn it into an accurate, well-finished pattern by hand. The example we'll be using is a new design for a carbon fiber airbox. We'll be going from a 3D design through to this finished composite pattern. In later videos in the series, we'll be showing you how to make split molds from this pattern, and then we'll go on to show you how to make a professional pre-preg carbon fiber part from those molds. Many projects that people tackle in composites aren't original designs, but are just reproductions of existing parts, but made in a lighter and stronger composite material, such as making a carbon fiber bonnet from a steel bonnet. In this case, molds can be directly taken off the original part and the pattern making process isn't necessary. However, in a case where you're looking to create an original component, an original design, you must first start off by making the pattern. For a pen and paper or CAD design product, the first hurdle is making the jump from the page or screen into the physical world. If resources allow it, then a 3D CAD file can easily be turned into an accurate pattern by CNC router. However, most people don't have ready access to such facilities and so the majority of composite patterns, particularly for smaller projects, still start off life being made by hand in the kind of way we're demonstrating in this tutorial. Patterns can be made of a wide range of materials, but by far the most common are MDF and polyurethane foam. In this tutorial, we're going to be using a low density polyurethane foam. And if you're unfamiliar with this material, then it's quite similar to the type of shapeable foam that's used for dried flower arranging and similar jobs. Expanded polystyrene foam, like this insulation foam or this styrofoam, are not suitable for a variety of reasons. The most obvious being that body fillers and pattern coating resins will all dissolve polystyrene foam, which is clearly bad news for your pattern. Polyurethane foam like this, on the other hand, is intended specifically for pattern making. Not only is it unaffected by solvents, resins and fillers, but as you can see, it's also incredibly easy to sand. Although we won't be using MDF in this tutorial, it's well worth considering for simple geometric shapes like this box, for example. It can also be used in conjunction with PU foam to create the bulk of a structure onto which PU foam can be bonded and shaped for more subtle contours. Once we have our basic shape, we'll use polyester body filler where necessary to fill and adjust the surface detail, and then we'll use dedicated pattern coating primer and gloss resins to take the foam pattern to a mirror gloss finish. So, enough of the intro, let's get on with this airbox. Having taken the measurements from the engine and air filter setup, we've modelled the part we want to produce in a 3D CAD programme. 3D CAD isn't necessary, 2D CAD or hand drawings will also suffice, but 3D CAD does allow us to take profile sections from the part itself. You can see here the overall shape that we're trying to produce, but also within that you can see section views. We're going to take these and print them out and use those as a reference when we come to produce the pattern. Having printed out our profile sections, we're going to transfer these onto sheets of PVC foam. The reason we use PVC foam is because it's a higher density than the PU foam that we use for the bulk of the pattern, so it'll sand away slower than the surrounding foam, preserving the important dimensions, but at the same time, it can be quickly cut with a knife and has some flexibility, which is helpful during assembly. Although we used a CAD program to generate these profile printouts, for simpler shapes, you could draw profiles like this by hand and still use the same process to ensure you have dimensional accuracy at critical points on your pattern. With all the basic profiles cut out, I'm now going to just adjust and refine the edges around the side, just with a sanding block to get them perfectly on the line and the shape's much more accurate. You can see here how accurate we're looking to cut these profiles. The more accurate they are, the easier job will be later on in the process. With the profiles cut, we can remove our guide templates and look at actually assembling the structure. So what we have here, two segments, that will slot together, and we'll continue to build this like a skeletal frame. You might also want to consider, especially for larger structures, using MDF for making the profiles. These sections here, we're just going to bond on using hot melt glue and then infill this to give it more rigidity in this plane. The more accurately you assemble your structure at this stage, the easier job will be later. So 
If you do have any misalignments and you need to make adjustments, do them at this stage to make sure that everything is as close as it possibly can be. With the templates completed, we're going to now infill all of these sections with blocks of a low density PU foam. Now this foam is very, very easily cut, just using a normal wood saw. So we could take a width of the section we're looking to produce, just mark it off, and saw it through. It's unlikely that your blocks are going to fit perfectly, especially if they've been cut by hand. So this can be solved just by carefully sanding them with a sanding block until the fit is very, very close and the templates can sit flat and true. With the blocks cut, we're going to bond these into the structure. Again, just using hot melt glue. Not an awful lot of glue is needed and you're looking to keep the glue away from the edge of the part because we don't want adhesive around where we're going to be sanding. You can see here that we have lines of adhesive that have effectively created a fillet in the templates. So if we were to try and just bond a block straight in, it wouldn't set right down into the base of the profile. So with just a quick sand on the corners, we can relieve that area, allowing the block to settle right to the bottom. We can now cut away the bulk of these blocks, bringing it as close to the template patterns as we can. Polyurethane foam is very quick and easy to shape using conventional hand tools such as sanding blocks and saws. In fact, often it's all too easy to go too far, which although recoverable, is not ideal. Working at 90 degrees to the profiles is a good method to ensure that you don't cut too far, especially in curved areas. Having roughed out the shape using a saw where practical, you then need to move on to a sanding block to carefully flat the foam down to level with the profiles. In some areas, especially with convex curves, you may need to just use the sandpaper on its own and carefully whittle it down to the profiles underneath. This area on the underside of the pattern is a little more tricky. The underside of the airbox should continue flat and finish with an arc radius. Now, I've got no templates to work to in this area, so I'm going to have to pretty much do it by eye, but with careful sanding and taking my time, it shouldn't be too difficult. You can see in this area where the pattern drops away. Now that's indicating that that should be a scoop in the original shape. So I've referred to the drawing and I'm just shaping it by eye to form the profile that was originally designed. We're just now going to move on to sanding some of the finer details. So we're going to look at the radiuses around the edge of the pattern. We've left these till the end because otherwise they're very fragile. And as you can see, we've managed to improvise a radius sanding tool to allow us to take the scoop out of the top of the pattern. With the pattern now in shape, we're going to address any gaps like this with car body filler, filling them and getting an even surface before going onto the pattern coat. Mix the polyester filler thoroughly in the conventional way. Then carefully fill any cracks and voids on the surface of the pattern. Scrape the surface of the pattern with the spreader, removing any excess of filler. The aim is only to fill the voids. You're not looking to add any additional thickness to the surface. Larger patterns may require several mixes, as typically the working time of the filler is only a few minutes. Continue to cover the entire pattern. With the filler hardened now, we're going to just lightly sand any high spots off the surface of the pattern. So we've sanded the surface and we've taken it right down so any high spots have completely gone and we're not too worried about the fact that it may have broken through the filler in certain places 
and other areas won't be completely even. The next stage we'll be building a little bit onto that and we can refine that surface from there. So overall, that's looking pretty good and ready for the coating. I'm just going to secure the pattern down onto a base plate so I can paint the entire surface with pattern coat without having to handle it. Before measuring out the pattern coat, you do need to mix it thoroughly. This has already been mixed now, so we're ready to measure it out. Catalyze the resin as accurately as you can to 2%. The pattern coat primer is designed to coat very evenly. As you're applying it, you'll find that the viscosity increases over the working time of the resin. This is a very useful feature of the coating system, allowing for a thick coverage without sags or runs. You're looking to build the coat to be as thick as possible without the coating starting to drain from the vertical faces. While we leave this one secure, I'm just going to show you how well it goes on to MDF as well. This is the pattern that we showed you a little bit earlier on in the video. Often, with simple MDF or wooden patterns, depending on the accuracy, you will find that one coat will build enough to achieve the final finish. Having left this first pattern coat to fully cure, we're now going to just sand the surface of the pattern, getting rid of any high spots and any ridges, and also have a look out for any low spots that we can address. You can see in these areas where the lines of the guide templates are emerging first. This is normal and we need to continue to flat this area with 120 grit paper over a block until the low areas you can see have gone. When block sanding the main areas, you are looking to sand out all but the very deepest of low spots. Almost inevitably this will break through the coating in a few small areas. Do not be tempted to focus the sanding on the low spots or sand them out without the block just using your hand as this will leave a visible ripple in the final surface. It won't be truly flat. Sand the detailed areas and radiuses last. These require careful attention as otherwise they are easily sanded too far. I've sanded this pattern as far as I'm going to take it at this stage. With pattern making it's very important to know when to stop sanding so we're just going to take a quick look at a few of the points. It's very common for the profiles to get sanded and exposed through first. These are, these are normally a high spot on your pattern. So we've just taken it just to the point where they've started to become exposed and then stop sanding at that point. You have to be especially careful when sanding radiuses, it's very easy to break through the pattern coat. You can see here we just started getting through to the body filler underneath, but with the next coat this won't cause us any problems. These areas here were low spots in the pattern where the body filler had broken through to the lower density foam, and that's translated through onto the surface here. If we'd have continued to try and sand these out, we would have broken right the way through the pattern coat and into the foam. So we're just going to address these low spot areas with a small amount of body filler. For the second layer, we're going to add a guide pigment into our pattern coat. This will assist us later on in identifying when we're breaking through into the next layer during sanding. We add the pattern coat pigment in a ratio of approximately 5%. The second coat of pattern coat primer is applied in exactly the same way as the first, looking to build a thick, even coat without any runs or sags. With the second coat now cured, we're going to flat it down and see where we get to. As this coat is more even, sanding the surface level is much quicker than the first coat. And, with the guide coat added, identifying when the coating is getting thin is easy, and this reduces the likelihood of breaking through. We're aiming to sand this coat completely level, removing every single low spot. You can see in these areas that the guide coat had indicated to me when I'd broken through the first layer, and I was about to break through into the pattern. In this case, I had to continue sanding until I had broken into the pattern, despite knowing this, because my main aim was to get rid of all of the low spots and flat the pattern completely. Now this has obviously committed me to applying another coat of pattern coat. 
This third application is once again mixed and applied in the same way as the previous ones, but with a slightly thinner coat to achieve a more level surface, making the subsequent sanding quicker and easier. We are moving on to a finer 240 grit paper for the flatting of this coat due to the more level and the even application of the coating. Once again, using a block on all of the flatter areas. You can see this coat is flatting down very quickly. It just needs sanding to the point where the low spots disappear and no further. When dry sanding, these are easily identified as glossy dark areas on the pattern. Once you have the bulk of the pattern sanded flat, carefully flat and smooth any details and corners. This can be done without the block if necessary, but be careful not to sand too far or introduce any unevenness into those areas. We've now flatted the pattern coat primer down to a 240 grit all over, and this has left us with a very flat and even finish. Now we have two choices at this stage. The first option is that we could continue through the grits and polish the primer coat. That would leave us with a satin finish. However, we're looking for a gloss finish, so we're going to continue on with the pattern coat high gloss to allow us to sand and polish this to a mirror finish. Just like the pattern coat primer, the high gloss is catalyzed to 2% and mixed thoroughly. The high gloss coat brushes very evenly and has excellent self-leveling properties. Ensure that the coat is even and finished with long continuous strokes in the same way that you would with household gloss paint. We've left the gloss coat to fully cure. Overnight's a good idea because it does need time to fully harden on the surface which makes the handling, flatting and polishing that much easier. The first thing we're going to look at doing is just removing it from the baseboard. We're going to start the gloss coat flat and polish using a 400 grit paper. Initially we will sand the area without water. This will allow us to identify the low areas easily as dark patches. Unlike many paint and resin systems, pattern coat is designed not to clog the paper, making this possible. Here you can see a low spot which must be sanded away. So, using the block, we must sand the entire area down until it is level, and the low area has disappeared. Finally, flat all of the more complicated areas and radiuses, which can't be done with the block, carefully by hand. You may find folding the paper a few times will make achieving a level finish that bit easier. With the surface completely flatted with a 400 grit, we're going to move on to wet sanding with an 800 grit paper. As the pattern is now already completely flat and level, the finer grits are only used to remove the scratches from the previous paper. Wet sanding both slightly speeds up the cutting of the paper and provides more uniform sanding performance. Although the use of a block is less important on the finer grits, it may still prove useful on flatter sections. Once the pattern has been completely sanded with the 800 grit paper and all of the scratches left by the 400 grit have gone, the pattern should be wiped clean and the water should be changed. It is important as it ensures that when the next paper is used, a 1200 grit, that no loose grains from the 800 grit paper remain. These will contaminate the water and could create coarser scratches when the finer grit paper is used. This is repeated once more when we move on to our final and finest paper, which is a 1500 grit. Now we're ready to move on to the last stage, which will be the polishing compound. I'm going to show you first how this can easily be achieved by hand, and then we're going to move on to a bit of machine polishing. You can see here the standard of finish that needs to be achieved before moving on to the compound. The surface scratches that are on this are only left by the 1500 grit. There's no coarse scratches and this should make our polishing stage very quick and easy. Essentially, polishing compound is a very fine abrasive paste. Simply buffing it firmly over the surface of the pattern will polish out the fine scratches left by the 1500 grit paper, leaving a full gloss finish. To give you an idea of how long this might take, the area we're looking at here is being taken from a sanded finish up to a full gloss in around about 30 seconds. 
Machine polishers really speed the job up and it would certainly be an advantage if this was a larger pattern. Polishing using a machine polisher uses the same technique as with polishing paint. If you're unfamiliar with this, it involves applying a thin coat of compound over the surface and then buffing with the machine using a soft sponge head. Great care must be taken not to hold the machine in one spot, it must be kept moving passing over the surface as otherwise it can easily lead to overheating the area and damage the coating. So there we have it, the completed pattern. In the next video in the series we'll be going on to produce split moulds from this pattern and then in the final video we'll be producing the airbox using out of autoclave prepreg carbon fibre.